When I was about six or seven years old, we moved out of the apartment block we'd been living in. Now, in my young mind, this was the biggest building in the world. I didn't return there for about 10 or 11 years. And when I did go back, I realized that it was a mere three stories high. So, what had changed? Not the building itself, merely my perception of it. And that's the theme of tonight's story. How time and our own minds can warp our perception of events. So here we see the same story as told by the same person, but from two very different perspectives. Which one you believe is down to you? Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends, because it's time to listen. Every so often I enjoy driving down Conrad Road. Coon Road, as the locals call it. It's a back road that eventually ends at a mountain, where I used to live as a child, up until I joined the military. I miss it. A lot. The surrounding forest. The privacy. Laying in the pool at night, staring up at the stars as bats would swoop low and take a drink of water. If you lay still enough, their wings and furry bodies would brush ever so softly against your chest. The memories are what I miss the most. The good with the bad. Those forests raised me in my tiny adolescence. It's where I spent the majority of my time, exploring, adventuring, letting my imagination run rampant with thoughts of big bad wolves, monsters, ninjas, and how I alone, the wayfaring warrior, would conquer all the big baddies that were in my way or after me. Pole Ridge is the name of the road I used to live on. And even now it still holds magic and mystery. Some divine and some nefarious. I drove up there recently and remembered a story from my youth. It's a twin story. One story with two different points of view. A true story. And a story my blooming mind envisioned. The Pig Many years ago, I'd grown restless one summer day. I'd pored through most of my books, and I felt a thirst for adventure that being inside wouldn't satisfy. Being young, on twenty-seven acres of land, surrounded by a forest, was all the setting I needed for a story to unfold. There was no stretch of woods I hadn't explored throughout the years, yet every time I set out I always seemed to find something new. Whether it was a new grapevine to swing from, a new rock to climb, or an old tree to push down while pretending I was a superhero and this tree was no match for my super strength. In the back of our property there was a path in the woods that my brother would occasionally use to camp in. The path had been used so much it was easy for an ATV to pass through. The trees and foliage grew up and over the path, giving the appearance of a natural cave made of twisting vines and leaves. This path always scared me. I could never put a finger on why, but I always felt uneasy being around it. Like there was some old curse over the trail. Like there were always invisible eyes watching me from its shadowy depth. That day, though, I decided to summon my courage and walk down it. I already knew where it went. If you followed the trail long enough, it would eventually dip down a hill and lead to a man-made pond surrounded by a small field, trees all around, and the house of one of my neighbours up on an adjacent hill. I knew where it led. I knew the surrounding paths and crisscrossing trees, and all the surrounding areas. I even knew when I was close to the path, and I would steer clear of it as I walked down a more favoured part of the woods. That day, though, that day, I would not fear the path. I put on my jeans, my boots, a white t-shirt, and told my mum I'd be back in a bit. I stopped by the barn and grabbed an old bayonet my grandpa had given me for my birthday. He needed a handle, so for me, it was a small sword. My Excalibur. Leaving the barn, I passed the pool, a woodpile, a stack of logs my dad bought for the log cabin he was building, and stood in front of the path. The uneasy feeling was there. 
but with sword strapped through my belt, I felt brave. Or at least, oh fuck, I'm going to die. I started down the path, letting my imagination run wild, and using my bayonet to cut down various weeds and vines that were in my way, playing games in my mind and breathing a steady joy that only a young boy can feel wielding a dangerous weapon and flinging it around without any care or personal harm. Because hell, what's the point of being outside if you weren't going to get a little scratched or bloody? I was in the woods for about 30 minutes, walking deeper and deeper, when I heard something. A crash. Twigs breaking. I stopped to listen. It wasn't uncommon to hear breaking twigs, crashes as a limb would fall, or hidden animals scurrying away. The woods are always alive with sounds, and living in them you learn the difference. They're never anything scary, or at least not really. Just the sounds of nature being nature. But there was something off-putting about this sound. It didn't sound right. I was an avid tree climber, thankfully, because that's the only thing that saved me. I kept hearing the sound grow closer. Crash. Grunt. Snap. Snort. I climbed up the closest tree, climbed about ten feet in the air, then hung upside down on a sturdy limb. A wild pig walked across the trail, and I hissed my breathing to a shallow inhale. It was brown, with spots of black, dirty, with large tusks jutting up from its mouth. Unlike domestic pigs, wild pigs would chase you, and those tusks open your bowels like a hot knife going through butter. Eventually the pig walked away, and I felt like it was safe to climb down. Rather than climb down, though, and feeling especially acrobatic with a sword through my waist. I flipped my legs over my head and dropped to the ground on all fours, then popping up with a little hop and a whoo. Well, the pig hadn't gone that far. I heard a squeal and crashing shrubs as it started to come after me. Panicked, I turned and ran. Looking over my shoulder was a mistake. The pig was still a good distance from me, but it was gaining. I turned and jumped at a low hanging branch, pulling myself up and climbing well out of reach of those tusks. I sat on a branch this time, and the pig squealed at the bottom of the tree. It put a hoof on the tree, raising itself up and started sniffing up at me, before dropping and making a few circles around the tree. Eventually, it got bored and walked back the way it had come. This time, I stayed in the tree for a good long while. When I felt like enough time had passed, I slowly and quietly climbed down, pausing every few branches to cast my eyes around the woods and to listen intently. Nothing. When I reached the bottom, I turned and ran, and kept running until the path opened and I was once more in the backyard of our property. See? Semi-short, to the point, true story of an account between a young boy and a wild pig. But, like I said in the beginning, this was a twin story, with one true, and one created from an overactive young imagination. I'll pick up the next story, with me in the first tree, hanging upside down by my legs. The Pig Man Something wasn't right about that sound. I thought this as I hung upside down by my legs, my left hand holding my bayonet firm within my belt loop. All sounds in the woods sound right, from a rabbit running through the leaves to a squirrel scurrying across tree trunks and limbs. Even an old tree limb falling dead to the ground just sounds right. These sounds, and all the others, sound right because they belong. But this sound, this sound didn't belong. It sounded like footsteps, the type of steps you or I would make, but it also sounded like an animal. 
As the sound got closer, I could hear breathing. The type of breathing you or I would make. But wrong. Unnatural. I was becoming afraid. And soon being afraid turned to all-out panic. The footsteps and the creature attached to them came into view. My young Christian mind automatically filled with thoughts of the devil, a cloven-hooved monster with pointy horns and a long curly beard, sent to grab me and take me down to hell for all my young sins. Swimming for too long, not telling my mum and dad I love them enough, fighting with my brother, not picking up sticks or mowing when I was told to. Yes, this is it. The devil had come for me. The devil stopped, and as I looked at him, something wasn't quite right. Of course, I was looking at him upside down. Slowly I pulled myself up so I could sit on the branch. I was a ninja after all. I could do so quietly without attracting attention. But my shoulder broke a branch, and it fell to the ground with a large crash. The creature jumped slightly at the sound and turned to look at the fallen branch, its eye focusing on the branch, and then following up the tree until it espied a young, bright-eyed boy sitting on a branch. We looked at each other, and the more I looked, actually looked, the less I was convinced that this was the devil. First of all, it had no horns. Every good Christian boy knew that the devil had horns. And he wasn't even fire engine red with a bifurcated tail. He had a pointy beard though, and cloven hooves. So, maybe this was some kind of lesser demon. That would explain why it had a piggish snout. Hello. The pigman grunted in a hoarse voice that scratched with unuse. Hi. I squeaked. What are you doing up there? It was a simple question. But for the life of me, I couldn't think of the answer. Oh, right. I'm up here because I heard a noise that scared the zippity-dippity shit out of me. Oh, I began lying. I was chasing a squirrel, and just when I thought I was going to get him, he jumped to another tree. A squirrel, huh? He glared for a moment, making me feel uneasy. Before grinning. Was that a grin? Dear God, please let that have been a grin. I like chasing squirrels, too. Saliva formed around the tusks jutting up from his mouth, and I shuddered to think what happened to the poor squirrels he'd managed to catch. The pig man began walking toward the tree, each step making me more and more nervous, and keeping a firm hold of my grandpa's bayonet, my Excalibur, was the only thing that kept me from screaming. You should come down and we can chase squirrels together. It'll be fun. This time, he lied. I don't know how I knew, but I did. Squirrels hardly stay on the ground, silly. My voice came out hurried, and as brave as I tried to tell myself I was, I felt that he could hear the fear. You should climb up, and we can chase them better that way. Oh, dear Jesus, please don't let him climb this tree. The pig man grabbed hold of a branch and it broke as he pulled. For a moment, a small moment, I could see his aggravation. And I felt a wave of relief hit me like a tsunami. He was too heavy to climb. I was safe in the tree. Do you like candy? He asked me. My home has a lot of candy. You should climb down and I'll give you all you like. Thanks, but I already have some candy. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out a bag of poppets. Small fireworks wrapped in a tiny white sack. These are sugar lumps. Ever have any? <laughs> They're really, really good. I pulled one out and put it in my mouth and held it between my teeth and cheek. The coarse grains rubbed against my tongue. The pigman sees me, and his eyes go hungry. Mm, come down and give me some, he says, holding out his hands as if to catch me. 
Catch, I said, tossing the bag down. The pigman caught the bag and emptied the whole thing into his greedy mouth. He yelped as he bit down, and the small fireworks popped and sparked in his mouth. Immediately spat out the burnt pieces and glared at me with hatred. The fear was renewed in the gaze, but he quickly softened his face and smiled. No, that's not a smile. There's nothing natural or sweet about that smile. I also have lots of toys in my place for kiddies who come to visit me. We have a lot of fun. <sighs> Climb down. Let's go play some games together. Do you have a fuzzy string? I asked. That's one of my favorite toys. What's a fuzzy string? He asked me. Let me show you. There was a silkworm nest above my head, and I reached up and broke off the branch. Catch! I said for a second time, tossing the branch down. The pigman caught it, and the sticky, silky threads instantly stuck to his hands and fur. Small wiggly worms started crawling all over him and into his pointy beard. The pigman dropped my fuzzy string and began frantically swatting and swiping at his body, flinging the worms and pieces of silk. He couldn't get them all, though, and Strand still stuck to his chest and beard. <sighs> Why, you little shit, he grunted. I'm going to suck out your intestines while you scream. Well... Fuck. The pigman angrily began snapping off branches and clawing at the tree, trying to reach me. Thank Jesus, he was too heavy, and all he could do was scratch the bark. Oh, I was scared. Boogeyman in the closet during a thunderstorm with the parents out of town type of scared. I climbed higher as tears of fear ran down my cheeks, my heart beating thunder in my chest. Time stretched for an eternity up in that tree, gazing down at a cursing, snarling, grunting monster that was trying to get me. Eventually, he stopped. <sighs> Guess you're just too smart for me, he growled. Watch your back, kid. He turned once, he made the threat, and then stomped off down the path. I waited. I don't know how long I waited. I waited until I stopped hearing his footfalls, listening closely as they became fainter and fainter. And then I waited some more. The forest was quiet, eerily quiet and with good reason. Slowly, branch by branch, I started climbing down, pausing every branch lower to the ground to listen and look. It took me about ten seconds to climb that tree, and about ten minutes to climb down. Then, on the last branch, only a few feet from the ground, I jumped. I landed on both feet and crouched down, scanning the woods. Nothing. Only trees. I started walking slowly. Much too slow for a child who'd just encountered a monster. But even as a child, I understood how sound traveled in the hills and in the forest. Too many snapping twigs or cracking leaves would give your position away fast. I was halfway down the path home when I heard a loud, guttural squeal. I took off running. Looking over my shoulder was a mistake, but I had to look. I told you to watch your back, the pigman shouted gaining on me with his tusks gleaming and his hooven feet kicking up dirt. I jumped toward a low-hanging branch and pulled myself up and began to frantically climb to escape the devil behind me. The pigman slammed into the tree and grabbed a hold of my foot. I kicked frantically, and he pulled forcefully. I lurched forward and almost fell off the branch I was on when my shoe came off in his hand. I pulled my feet up and stretched them along the branch as my crotch grew wetter with my panicked, choking breaths. You're not getting away this time, he growled, circling the tree, never taking his eyes off me. I shut my eyes and began praying the nightly prayer my mother had taught me. 
Opening my eyes, I looked at the scratches newly formed on my arms from my frantic run and climb. Limply, my arms fell at my side as I wondered how I was going to get away this time. If I was going to get away. When my hand felt something solid and familiar. The bayonet. Excalibur. Taking a deep breath, I spoke. Phew, that was a fun race. But you don't want to eat me, pig man. Little boys are pointy and sharp. Um, bullshit, he growled up at me. I can see the scratches and cuts on your arm. You're soft and chewy. He drawled then, looking at the blood welling on my arm hungrily. Oh, that's just rust, I said. Don't you know little boys are made of metal? We rust easy because we're always outside. Yeah, prove it, he sneered. Reach down and let me feel you. Okay, I said. But close your eyes so I know you're not going to pull me down. <laughs> you got it. I thought I heard a low chuckle as he closed his eyes. Pulling my bayonet from my belt, I climbed down low enough to put the blade within his hand. Close your hand, but not tight, and you'll feel I'm made of steel. Gotcha, he shouted, closing his hand firmly on the blade of the bayonet. I pulled up and forward with all my might, slicing deep into his palm and slicing to his fingers near clean off. He wailed in pain and gazed at the blood running from his palm and two of his fingers hanging on by skin. The sound that came forth from his mouth I'll never forget and I hope I'll never hear it again. It was unnatural, that sound, full of pain and maliciousness. It was the sound of hatred, the sound of murder. The pigman turned then and ran down the trail, holding his hand and leaving a trail of blood behind him. When he was out of sight, I jumped down and hightailed it home as fast as my legs would carry me. I didn't stop when I exited the trail and was back on our property. I didn't stop until I jumped on the front porch of our house and dashed through the door. My mum was in the kitchen, making dinner for the night. Hey, George. Have fun. I stood and panted, and then ran and threw my arms around her, hugging her tight. Oh, she said, surprised, then wrapping her arms around my tiny body. Mom? I asked. Hmm? After dinner, can I call Grandpa? I want to thank him again for the bayonet. I never told my mom, or my family for that matter, about the pig. Never told them about my brush with death and how I tricked death three times. Even as a kid, I understood some stories need to go untold. Some stories need to remain in the closet with the bogeyman, never seeing the light. Many years later, I was camping down that same trail, the memory of the pig distant and all but forgotten. The girl I was seeing at the time thought camping would be fun, so I set up a tent, made a firing, and set up everything for our little secluded getaway. During the night, I had to walk back to the house to get a jug of water I'd forgotten, and asked her if she wanted to come with me. She said she didn't, that she'd stay by the fire to make sure it didn't go out. I paused, but only briefly, and told her to make sure the flame stayed high. I paused, because for a moment I felt uneasy. I felt something unnatural. I kissed her on the lips and told her I'd be back soon. I ran to the house, grabbed the jug of water and ran back. I ran more to get back to the girl and less out of the sense of unease I felt, or at least that's what I told myself. When I reached the fire, it was going strong and my girlfriend was sitting close to it, my little bayonet in her hand. Even in my older years, I kept it with me any time I went into the woods. It was a reminder of my grandfather, and whenever I had it with me, 
I felt like he was still here. You okay? I asked, setting the jug down and sitting next to her, placing my hand on her leg. Oh, I think there's something in these woods. She stared, she stared at me, wide-eyed. Oh, it's just the woods, dear. Of course there's things in them. She glared at me, and I realized I unintentionally called her stupid. Softening, and apologetically, I said, What do you think is out there? I don't know, she said. I just kept hearing this odd grunting. It didn't sound natural. Well, fascinating idea that one, wasn't it? Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Which one do you think was real? The more fantastical or the more mundane? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think in the comments below. So, don't be shy. Make sure to leave a comment and I'll do my best to reply to as many as I can. Now, I know Christmas is coming up, but I think I can squeeze another story in before. So, I'll see you all again on Friday. For now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>